All right, I'll show you how to build a fire, Tom. You don't know how to build a fire. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to Ask This Old House. Whoa, fire in the barn, what's going Absolutely. on? Absolutely. Well, today I'm gonna go out and replace a wood fireplace with this, a gas insert. They're efficient and they're convenient. Nice. What are you up to today, Kev? Me? Well, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna help a family start talking to each other. Sue! Susan! Kev, will you call me? Susan! Mommy, Daddy! Sue! Hey, Kevin, when visitors come to my house, they get my attention by either rapping on the glass, hitting the wood on the side here. Yeah, okay, so you guys would actually be well served uh, with a doorbell? Well, actually, intercom is more what we were thinking. House kind of rambles along in here, mm -hmm. kind of right. stretches way back. So some nice detail here in the stairwell. This is original to the house? 1894, the house was built, absolutely. Beautiful. So you're thinking an intercom system. Although, wow, you guys are thinking about a lot. You got a ton of projects going on. Well, this room isn't really much. All we gotta do is kinda clean up the walls, clean up the woodwork, maybe refinish the floor. Really, we've done a lot of work back here in the kitchen area. Nice. My brother-in-law and I, uh, just over the course of the last week, installed new kitchen cabinets. Mm -hmm. uh, the appliances just arrived yesterday. Beautiful. Still have to hook those up. Gas, water, new the floor? refrigerator and everything. Antique heart, heart pine reclaimed. Did you lay this? Absolutely, $1,500 if somebody else did it. Well, that's a good reason to learn. You did a nice yeah. job. So what I'm thinking is uh, if we could put it up here, you know, this way I could answer the door. Everybody's going to be hanging in the kitchen. Also talk to the kids upstairs. Yeah. Seems like a reasonable request. I think we can help you out. That'd be great. Scott Matthews is our electrician who's helping us out. Scott, what are we working with here? Uh, we have all the components here for the intercom system, which mm -hmm. we're installing. Uh, this here is the outdoor unit. Has a speaker, microphone, and a push button to ring the doorbell. Gotcha. On the face side and on the back side. The back side is where we make our termination connection. We run Cat5 wiring in the wall, and it simply plugs into the back. Okay, so this one's going to go out by the front door. What are we going to be using on the inside? Uh, this is the indoor unit. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be installing one here on the second floor and also one in the kitchen. Gotcha. On the back side, it has the same type of connection that we plug our Cat5 wiring into. And Pretty where simple. is the Cat5 going to? Uh, each module has a separate home run, which runs to the basement. In the basement, we have the central termination point where we run the other end of the Cat5 wiring to, and they plug right into this point. And a home run is a direct shot from the module to this basement unit right there. That's correct. All right, so we're going to start up here in the second floor hallway, correct? Are you ready to get going? Yes, we're going to place this unit right in the wall here. Now, to install this unit here, we're going to run the wire up into the attic, down the chimney chase to the basement where our central termination point is. So up and over is easiest for us. Exactly. Well, I've already drilled a hole down into this wall to determine that it is a hollow space we can get into. Good. Okay. Uh, we're going to trace this box out here where our hole is going to be, and 54 inches is a common height for a intercom. It's pretty close uh, for children and adults. It's a good average height. Once we're done tracing the box, we're going to, it is old Latin and plaster, so we're going to very slowly take our time at cutting into this wall. We're going to take an old screwdriver and just simply notch around the plaster as opposed to going in with a saw, which might damage the old horsehair plaster and, and the wall can crumble quite a bit. So just little taps uh, on the screwdriver. You're not even actually penetrating all that plaster, just a, a dotted line outline. Exactly. We want to break the surface, and then we can scratch a little deeper once we get the get the uh, perimeter of the hole cut. Oh, look at that. One nice piece. Well done. Now we'll cut the wood lath out with our keyhole saw very carefully. I like to leave a little bit left on one side while I cut the opposite side. It holds the wall together a little better. And so for the pieces on the top and the bottom that are still behind the plaster, how are you going to finish those off? What we're going to do is we're just going to simply break this board across the horizontal grain to keep from damaging the plaster above and below, it'll yeah. break right out. Boy, that was nice. Now, if you remember, we used a standard electrical box to trace out our opening. After removing the plaster, we noticed there was a stud inside here, which prevents this standard box from fitting into the hole. So fortunately, we're using a low-voltage system, which allows us to use a low-voltage ring, which does not have a back on the box, and it fits right into this opening perfectly. That's nice. Let me show you how this low-voltage ring works. Once you start tightening the screw, it moves this tab upward behind the plaster. As you tighten the screw, it moves against the back of the plaster and tightens it into place. Oftentimes, the best way to get a wire from the second floor down to the basement is first come up into the attic here and look for a chase like this chimney, okay. which would lead us directly to the basement. So what I'd like you to do is pass this fish tape here yeah. alongside the chimney. 
uh, down to the basement. Once we get to the basement, we'll tie on the Cat5 wire and bring it up into the attic here. Now we have our wire connected in the basement. We can pull it up to the attic here and then drop it right down to the intercom unit on the second floor. Cool. Now we're pulling this cable underneath the floorboards from the chimney. Next, we're going to pass a shorter piece of fish tape down the wall to our second floor intercom opening. All right, hold it. I got it. Come up a little bit. A little more. All right. All right, I got the Cat5. Now that we've prepared this cable for installation, these eight wires are arranged in a very specific order to be installed into this modular plug. So what is the order? White, green, green, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. Seriously? White, green, green, what? It's white, green, green, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, and brown. If you say so, all right. And what we do now is we install the wires into this plug here, mm -hmm. push them all the way in until they're seated all the way, to ensure a, a good connection. Now we're going to crimp it with our crimp tool, which finalizes the connection. So the eight individual wires don't have to be stripped. They're actually going to be pierced by this crimp? That's correct. We squeeze it together, and there's a perfect connection. Now here in the basement, we have our central distribution point with our intercom module installed, mm -hmm. and we've provided power to plug into. And we've also got the three home runs of the Cat 5. So we've got one coming from the kitchen, one coming from the front door, and then this one's from the second floor hallway. That's correct. And we've also verified that all these cables have good connections with our tester here. So this tester verifies that we have a good connection on all eight of our conductors, and that tells you right there that we've passed. Oh, yeah, okay. So the green-white's working, the green's working, the white-blue, the blue, they're all working. Yes, <laughs> yes, they're all working, all eight. Excellent. And so now we uh, can just plug them in here? Exactly. We, we plug these in. No particular order because once we set up upstairs, we identify each one with a name. Now we have to install the one in the kitchen and also the one at the front door. Let's give it a try. We'll be their first guests. Who is it? It's Kevin. Who's this? It's Kevin. Oh, hey, Kevin. Can we come in? Absolutely, Kevin. That chime you heard from outside is programmable to 20 different tones that we can program the system to. Okay. Also, another nice feature is if we have more than two intercoms, we can address an individual room as opposed to broadcasting the entire house. That's a nice feature. What do you think, Kevin? Well, I like it, but more importantly, let's find out what our homeowner thinks. So, Kevin, what do you think? This is really great, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No more yelling in this house. Nice job, Scott. <laughs> Here we go, guys. Wow, three great coupes. All right. It's green, oh, that's it's plastic, uh -huh. and it's round. Oh, thank that's you. That's great. Yeah. What is it? Well, first of all, Roger, you left out a very important component to this. I didn't yeah. want to give it away. The stand. All right? All right. What's the best thing we like to do when we go home at night? We turn the TV Sweet. on. Eat. No. Mm -hmm. Across the nation, everybody does it. They turn it on and they play the lottery. They're looking for that number. Yeah, this is a play-at-home lottery game. Okay. You spin it, you spin it, you're right? And this is teaches you how to pick that magic number. Spin it, everybody ready? Come on. Oh, look at reach in there. I think it's there. Come on, baby. Here it is. Here it is. Nine. Yes. Oh. Wait a minute. Could be six. Oh, yay. Protest. Protest. No, I saw this the other day, actually. I thought it was a pretty good idea. You know, bowling is a really a popular thing all around the country. Oh, yeah. But for kids, it can be really demoralizing. You know, they go out there and they take that little ball, and it goes all the way down, goes in the gutter, might miss the pins. Oh, gosh. This oh, is Mega Ball. We also call it strike a matic <laughs> It has three, a handhold, finger holes right here, and this very handy handle right here. Say that handy a few times. Handle. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Say that a few times, Dad. So, now, you get there, you line it up. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it helps the confidence. We can kill a couple <laughs> kids in the process. Now, nope, good guess, but you're wrong. All right, guys, what is the worst part of the week, other than coming to work with two clients? <laughs> yeah. Garbage night. Sure. Yeah. Right, you got to drag those big, heavy barrels yeah. out to the curb. Yeah, my kids hate it. Back. My kids hate it. Not with this. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> you just put your garbage right in here all week long, yeah. fill it up with yeah. the bags, and then on Monday night, that's garbage night in my town, yeah. after you've sealed it up like this, <laughs> yeah. you just pull it together. 
A garbage yeah. man, when they're done, they just roll it back to you. What do you do? I live on a hill. Uh, hill's a problem. <laughs> garbage men don't always roll it back. <laughs> but it works. Kev, you're close. You actually fill it with stuff, but you don't fill it with trash. You fill it with organic material from your house. This is a compost. You just take the top off. Banana peels, apple cones, anything. Paper, you fill it up in here, you add some water, and then... The important thing to make the compost is to get air into it, and these tubes are going to allow air to go in. The compost. All right, so you seal it up. Now, with the usual compost pile, you have to go out there every once in a while with a pitchfork and turn that over. Oh, yeah, I hate that. Mm -hmm. Not with this. Yeah. This saves you, Richie. You spin this, and those tines help aerate that material in here, breaking it down into usable compost. Black gold. What about the children? They can bowl on their own. <laughs> Richard, the reason I wrote to you is that I love a big fire, but in the 20 years I've lived here, this fireplace has always smoked. And so it's gotten so I just don't even use it anymore. And you hear that as a common complaint. The other thing about a wood fireplace like this is it often is very inefficient. You know, you might have plenty of heat coming out when the fire's at its highest point, but after that point, it starts to cool, and all the air inside the house goes right out the chimney, and you can't really close off the damper until it's shut off. Today, we're going to install a gas insert. Now, people love these because they're convenient. You hit a button, and the fire comes right on. But there also is no issues with the draft like you had. It takes its air from outside and it vents to outside using a fan. Now this unit is going to mount right here. You can see we've already run some electrical behind it. I'm going to run a gas line. But our installation really starts today on the roof to run our air and vent lines. John Sullivan's a local stove and fireplace expert and can help us with the installation today. So what's our first step? Our first step is removing the existing cap from this chimney. All right. First thing I'm going to do is remove these screws holding the uh, top onto the mesh so that we can uh, remove the whole top. Got it? Yeah. Thank you. This cap is secured to the top of the uh, chimney with silicone sealing, which I'm going to remove now. Okay, all right, so good. that's all set. Now, this chimney actually has two flues. This one on the left is for the heating boiler, and this one's for the fireplace. It has a spring-loaded damper. And that's got to go. And that damper is just silicone to the top like the cap was. Exactly. With the uh, cap and damper removed, we're going to put these two flexible aluminum liners down the fireplace for it. Two different sizes. Yeah, this one is actually going to bring all of the combustion air to the insert itself. So the air to be burned goes right down to the insert. Yeah, and this one has the uh, flue gases exiting from the insert. Okay, good. So it's time to go back up. Yeah. The first liner we're going to drop down is the exhaust liner, which is the larger of the two, the four inch. That's a good idea. And what we'll do is drop this weight down so we can get the rope down to the bottom yeah. and then we can pull the liner down. Okay, pull line. Almost there. Okay. Now we're pulling the intake liner down. To uh, seal the flue and keep the rain out, we're going to put this top plate on and seal it with uh, high temperature silicone. Okay, that's sealed up nice and tightly. All right, so we've got our intake and our exhaust, and these two pipes will transition to one pipe with a special termination fitting. So the exhaust goes there, the combustion air goes there. And now you'll see it transition to a single termination piece. Just pass me that cap, John. There you go. And this is all you'll see from the street, like so. What we're going to do is we're going to put a bead of silicone on these okay. uh, two outlets. Okay, let's get a couple screws in there. Now we're going to screw the termination piece to the top plate. Good, we're all set. All right, so our last piece is the top cap. So that slides down there. And then just spin it. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, and lock all right. that up. Now, John, to keep the critters out of the flue that comes out from the boiler, you've got this ingenious cap with spring clips right here. We'll just wedge that down. Great. Well, down here in the basement, my work actually begins. This is the base of the chimney right here. 
And the fireplace is right up above it? Yeah, just above your head. Now down here we've got an oil-fired heating boiler. We've got a gas water heater. The exhaust flues for those two appliances come together and go into the right-hand flue of that chimney. And we'll be using the left-hand flue for the fireplace insert? Absolutely. Now your new gas fireplace needs a gas supply. So what I've done is I've tapped into the gas supply right here. You can see there's a T-fitting. And here's a shutoff valve. This is a little test port right here for the local inspector. And now I've run this piping in pre-cut lengths. I'm going to just thread it together. I've got piped open every joint connection. And now here's my drop right here. And how are we going to get that up to the fireplace? Well, I'm actually going to copy what the electrician did. Here's where he ran his supply right into the old ash pit from the old fireplace. I'm going to run my gas line right next to it and pop right up into the back of the firebox. All right, I've run my horizontal line down in that ash pit. Now I just have to catch that pipe down all the way down at the base. I think I got it. Yep. All right, so now we have our gas coming out from the ash pit to the firebox right here. I put an elbow on. And now I want a service shutoff called a gas cock right here. So that, I've put some pipe dope on my threads. I just want to tighten that up. Okay. Now, to allow for our final connection to the gas insert, we're going to use this, a flexible gas supply. This will attach on this side. And it gives us some play to make up this final connection to our gas insert. I just give me a hand sliding this. Okay, in. actually, before we do that, what we'll do is plug it into the receptacle here okay. first. The loser now. Yeah. All right, just be careful when you scratch it, lift it in. A little farther. All right, so now I can make my gas connection right here. Slide it back a little bit more. All right, good. I've made the gas connections, but I'm going to turn on the gas downstairs and test those connections. Okay, and I'll make the exhaust and the intake connections here. We're using the high temperature silicone, which can withstand temperatures up to 500 degrees to make the connection down here. go. I just installed the arch doors and it's all set to go. It's beautiful. You think it looks good now? Try firing it up. Hit that button on the remote control. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much, guys. It's our pleasure. Nice job, Rich. Thank you. And did Martha love her new fireplace? <laughs> she, <did. laughs> she really did. Here's the unit we installed. This is a gas insert. It has combustion that goes in through this inlet and exhaust that leaves through here. The important distinction about this unit is it is sealed combustion. No air from the building goes into the place where the flame exists. It's completely shut off. Now behind this firebox is a fan. And when this fire is going, the fan can come on and can bring some of the air from the room in behind the firebox, pick up some of its heat, and send it right into the room. So it does a really good job heating the space. Mm -hmm. So it's actually like a heating appliance. Absolutely, it's rated as such. Okay. So this unit, the gas insert, is often confused with the other alternative called a gas log. So what's the distinction here? Well, a gas log just would go right in the same firebox where you used to burn wood, you run a gas line to it, you'd ignite the flame, and this would go right up that same chimney. That's going to take a lot of its air from inside the building. That's because this is an unsealed unit. It pulls right. the air from the room, actually sends it out the chimney, right. or it could back up into right. the room. And you can't just pop this in. If you had a bad draft on your existing chimney right. that used to have a little smell of smoke in the room, you can't just put this in. You've got to make sure you fix that chimney so you have good draft. Nature of an unsealed unit. Right. And by code, you have to be sure you disable or remove the existing damper. Get rid of the damper? Why is that? Absolutely. If you had a damper that was closed with a wood fire, you'd smell it. The smoke would come in the room and you'd know right away. Right. With gas, if that thing was closed, you'd, you'd have flu particles that come in and you don't smell. There's no smoke. And it's got carbon monoxide and that's dangerous. Okay, so the code is going for safety there. And in this case, it's really not that efficient. Right. Now, one way you can offset that is to be sure that glass doors that can tightly seal when that unit's not on, they have to be open when the fire's on so you have combustion air to go into the chimney. Got it. Now, this unit, the gas log, I always say, this is for romance, it's for appearance, uh. where this is for heating efficiency. Now, what is the cost difference between the two? Well, a gas log, as we see it right here, is about $700 to $1,000. If you add a door to it, it's probably $1,500. This unit, as we're looking, is about $1,800, but there's some things we have to add to it. We need to pick out a front. Yeah, here's one here, stainless steel, yeah, pretty nice. The front's going to be $200, $500, and this thing is hammered copper, and that's about $1,000. Nice look. All right. Okay.
We also have to pick what type of brick pattern we want inside the firebox. It's a regular pattern. Here's a herringbone right here, and we have some choices what the logs look like inside. So we have to pay for those costs, but we've also got some installation costs with this one as well. That's right. There's more installation here because we have to run those lines inside the chimney, and we have to get up on the roof, which I don't like to do at all. All right. Well, in either case, it's a good side-by-side -side analysis of two. Thank you. Good options. Thanks. All right. Well, keep the letters and the emails coming because we'd love to hear from you. And until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thuy. I'm Roger Cook. And I'm Tom Silver. For Ask This Old House. You don't like getting on the roof? I, don't like, it, I like a fire, but I don't like getting on the roof for sure. If you have a question about your house or a tip you'd like to share, please let us know. Visit our website, pbs.org, for expert advice, step-by-step -step videos, and much more. Next time on Ask a Sold House. Today we're out on the road in Baltimore, Maryland. Known for its beautiful inner harbor, blocks and blocks of historic row houses, and the famous Maryland crab cake. Delicious.